Boom, we're on. Boom. Today's guest, we've got Dr. David Hamilton. First of all, David, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's so how, great to be here. Yeah, how are you? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Good. So, a man who had a PhD, or well, got a PhD, um, you worked in the pharmaceutical industry, one of yeah. the biggest in the world. Yeah. And then you change. You're a man who believes on the placebo effect, the law of attraction, kindness. You've wrote 10 books. I watched your documentary on Netflix called Heal, which was amazing, by the way. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, it's good to have you on. I have a lot of serious criminals on, which is a lot of big hitters for people, but this is the stuff I love to talk about. The mindset, the change, believing in yourself and that anything's possible. So you're doing amazing things. You're everywhere. We'll go right back to the start, though, where you where you grew up and how it all began. Oh, wow. Uh, I never get asked these kind of questions. This is, I love talking about <laughs> <laughs> my background, you know, uh -huh. where I, I grew up in a wee village called Bank Knock. Where's this? Uh, it's in central Scotland. It's about... It's about nine miles south of Stirling and close to Falkirk. It's in that wee kind of the Fourth Valley type area. Yeah, maybe about 18 miles from Glasgow, actually. And so I grew up there, tiny wee village, you know, tiny wee place as well. And it's it's close to a mining community. So there was mine. My dad grew up in a wee village called Croy, just a few miles away. And that's a miners community. Bank Knock had an open cast coal mine. So it's very much a working class little village. Mm -hmm. This expanded over the years, but when I was there in the seven, when I was born and grew up there as a child in the seventies, my mom, my mom and dad still live there. It's very much a working class little community. Uh -huh. So how was your upbringing then? Oh, great! You know we were poor, mm -hmm. but it's funny. Even though we were poor, because my, my dad worked in the building trade. He was initially he was a a, a labourer, then a demolisher, and then he became a, a cement finisher expert. But my dad for years was in and out of work because, you know, in Scotland, the building mm. trade slows down in the winter. So everybody, all the newer casual workers get paid off, you know, November, December. So every Christmas, my dad was out of work for a month and my mum was struggling. So she was always taking loans for the, you know, payday loans. A Provident, guy from mm -hmm. the Provident yeah. used to come every Thursday. Tony, uh -huh. the collector. Uh -huh. <laughs> so That's when up. you locked the door and shut uh -huh. the blinds. But he was a lovely guy and he used to come with a lined book and it was uh, Jeanette Hamilton. My mum has paid like a pound or five pound. and So we, we were poor, but I never seemed to want for anything because my mum and dad always did the best they could. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I, I had great upbringing with my uh, three sisters. I'll have three sisters. And we were all pals and stuff. So I, even though we were poor... I don't really feel I, I wanted anything because I, I, I was happy in that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into the pharmaceutical industry? Uh, kind of roundabout kind of way. Well, I, I, did, a, I did a degree at university. Mm -hmm. I never, ever imagined going to university. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I was the second person in the entire village of Banknock <laughs> who had ever gone on to higher education. <laughs> and it was only because it wasn't a thing... It wasn't the thing that people did in our in Bank Knock, in our mm -hmm. wee village, especially back when I was growing up. And I remember my chemistry teacher, Mr. Tracy, he took me aside after my, my hires and he said, have you ever thought of going to university? And I went, oh, no, I, God, my mum and dad couldn't afford that. And I, I honestly, this was like 86, 87, 86 maybe, and I honestly thought that there was only two universities in Britain and that was Oxford and Cambridge. And I thought maybe I thought there was a few others that had seen a university challenge, and I had this perception <laughs> that you had to be really clever because uh -huh. I'd seen Oxford and Cambridge on the boat yeah, race, yeah, yeah. and I thought you had to be really, really massively intelligent, or really wealthy, or ha or be very well spoken, and that and all three of those things isn't what I knew, uh -huh. and I just it seemed so above me. And Mr. Tracy sat me down. He said, oh, no, you can go to university. You're really good at chemistry. And here's how it works. You get a grant. To not, you used to get a grant and that would pay you for the, mm -hmm. the year kind of thing. And I suddenly, I, I did chemistry only because it was Mr. Tracy, my chemistry teacher, who explained it all to me. Uh, planted the seeds. Yeah. Probably. And other, I, I might have gone and done maths, but because mm -hmm. maths I was slightly better at. But I did chemistry because Mr. Tracy made it sound so exciting and, mm -hmm. and all the things that you could do if you were a chemist, you could even go into medicine and all that kind of stuff. And so I, I went to university and, and hit the ground running, did really, really well, ended up doing a PhD in what's called synthetic organic chemistry, mm -hmm. which is like Lego. But instead of taking, instead of taking Lego bricks of different shapes and sizes and colours to assemble a variety of shapes, uh -huh. an organic chemist 
takes atoms instead of Lego bricks, mm -hmm. but atoms that are Lego bricks and you get like a carbons and hydrogens and nitrogens and oxygens. But the principle of assembling a variety of shapes is the same. Mm -hmm. And the variety of shapes is pharmaceutical drugs. And that's why I ended up in the pharmaceutical industry. So what kind of drugs were you making for, what, for patients? Uh, or? Cardiovascular mostly and also cancer. Right. Yeah. So literally, you're you're assembling different shapes uh -huh. that we've already found through a previous research step uh -huh. that maybe show a good ability to, you know, change the activity something inside the arteries uh -huh. or change something around the the pathology of cancer. Right. How long did you do that for? Four years. And then the light bulb moment for yeah. the pharmaceutical industry to then the placebo effect. So yeah. where did that? Snow? Where did that well, drop? Well, do you know? After my youngest of my three sisters was born in 76, my mum had postnatal depression and it wasn't understood very well there. You know, the psychiatrist said, give yourself a shake. This was 1976. And that's not how you treat someone with postnatal depression. But my mum ended up with this, con this idea that she's not a good mum or she's not a strong person because she just assumed everyone must feel this way. But the they must just get through it because my mum it wasn't explained to her properly she didn't it wasn't understood so my mum thought I'm just not a strong person now we know postnatal depression is very it's not it's wet, much better understood but my mum ended up depressed going through that depression because it wasn't treated very well and I found a book in the school library as daft as it might sound I was my first week at high school I think I was 11 years old a book fell off the shelf The Magic Power of Your Mind I thought wow I bet I can help my mum so I just took it. I didn't know you're supposed to join a library, <laughs> you uh -huh. know, get a wee yellow card, get it stamped. I just uh, put it in my bag. We've still, <laughs> we've still got it. <laughs> you know, it was 38 years ago, 37 mm -hmm. years ago. Anyway, it really helped my mum. Now, it didn't cure depression in a day, but it taught her strategies about positive thinking and it taught her about uh, affirmations and belief and the power of the mind and meditation so my mum put all these things into practice and she used to do pump her fist with positive affirmations. So I grew up in that environment. My mum and I often talking about the power of the mind and because my mum was so excited about the power of the mind because it had worked for her mm -hmm. and she was so passionate about it, it, it really, it was contagious. Mm -hmm. And so all the way, even through my PhD, I was reading books on the power of positive thinking. Norman Vincent Peale, one of the first books I ever read actually, and it was a positive thinking book. And... So when I went into the pharmaceutical industry, although I loved the science of organic chemistry, building drugs, I was so drawn to the placebo effect because that was a demonstration of the fact that something in someone's mind was having a physical effect in the brain, but also a physical effect in the body. And I used to ask my colleagues and they didn't understand it. They would just say, oh, it's just a placebo effect. But they didn't understand because they hadn't really thought and realized that a mind, something in the mind wasn't just making people think they feel better, which is what my colleague said, oh, they're not getting better, they just think they're getting better, but that was completely wrong. There's actually a physical change in the brain and wow. a physical change in the body. Once I really took that to heart and realised there's something really powerful here, and nobody knows about this, so I'm going to resign. And I had this idea that I'm going to write a book and I'm going to go out and teach people how they can harness their mind and emotions and even positive feelings like love and compassion and kindness and have a beneficial health giving effect. And wow. so I, it was so strong in me that I just decided, I was at a Tony Robbins Unleash the Power yeah, of Within yeah, yeah. weekend and he got us to do this visualisation where he said, now think of a time in your life when something happened that if it didn't happen, your life would have gone in a different direction. And I could think of a couple of things. He said, now make a decision that will mm -hmm. change your life. And I just decided I'm leaving my job. Yeah. And I literally resigned the next day back at work. That takes a lot of bottle, especially in that industry. If people are reading from textbooks and trying to find cures from pharmaceutical drugs to help patients, and you're kind of going against that with saying, you can basically change your mind, change the chemistry in your body. The brain only repeats what it knows. Yeah. So how were you treated then when you were saying to people about this placebo effect if they didn't quite understand it? Did they think you were going crazy? Or it, But I, all of those things, yeah. actually, I, I'd say my, my closest friends were so supportive because it wasn't, I didn't tell them really the full truth. I, I told everyone that I was really going over, I was really going into teaching personal development. But what I really meant is a big part of that personal development was mind and emotions mm -hmm. and how they affect the body. I just didn't 
say that to everyone because I was aware that people would think I was a bit daft. Mm -hmm. But then my close friends did know that that was my interest and they didn't disagree with me. But I think a few, there was murmurs throughout the company and I knew a few people must have thought I'd lost my marbles, to use uh, their language. I think mm -hmm. one person said, you've lost your marbles mm -hmm. kind of thing. And only because they didn't, understand i think some people also yeah. have, i think many people have a passion in life but don't have the courage to follow yeah. it and, and i say some of the people maybe that were resistant to that it was because it pressed their buttons because they wanted mm -hmm. to follow the dream yeah. and just didn't have the courage it wasn't that they didn't believe what i was doing it's yeah. just it, it presses your button sometimes and i think that's where a lot of people go wrong in life they've got great ideas they've got great visions but as soon as they share it with someone else who doesn't understand that then they reflect their fears on it and then yeah. it's very off-putting so to create ideas and go, do you know what? I'm sticking to my guns and I'm going to stick to it. So the placebo effect, David, can you explain this to for people then who don't quite understand that? Yeah, so the placebo effect is that effect, that thing that happens when you believe that a, something is a drug, something will help you. So the placebo actually comes from the Latin for I shall please. So a, plac you can, a placebo could be a, you know, a cup of water. If you'd, for example, had told me, I'll just say I had a really sore head. Let's say I had a really sore head and you said, oh, I've dissolved some aspirin or paracetamol or some other dissolvable painkiller in that water. And it's so good. It just tastes like water. And I really believed you because maybe you're a doctor, right? And you said that to me. I'm going, oh, thank you very much. And I go, and my headache starts to go away. So the placebo effect is the fact that my headache goes away, but there was just water in there. And I just believed something about, I believed something about that water and Trick my head went away, tricked to mine. And what, but what actually happens, the reason why the pain goes away is because my belief generates biochemistry. And the biochemistry that's generated in my brain is exactly what's required to deliver to me the thing that I expect. So I'm expecting a reduction in pain. So it's like my brain says, okay, you're expecting a reduction in pain. How do we do that? Well, we do that by producing our own painkillers. So the brain now produces its own painkillers. They're called endogenous opiates, like opiates like mm -hmm. morphine and stuff. Uh, endogenous opiates means your own version. And so the brain produces its own painkillers, i.e. endogenous opiates, to give you that reduction in pain because that's what you believe is supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's how the placebo effect in large part actually works. Do you believe the brain can cure anything? Uh, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that only because you have certain true genetic disorders. I say the, your mind can generate huge positive effects, uh, whether it can actually, whether the power of consciousness, let's, let's mm -hmm. even take that a step further, can cure anything. I don't think we understand that well enough. I have my personal beliefs about the nature of reality, but generally from what we understand uh, in, in science is... The, even in the placebo effect, there seems to be, you know, not, I, I, I don't like the term limits. I don't think there's any real limits. Limitless. Everything's limitless. I think I ever, everything's limitless. But I think what we understand in science so far takes you so far. You know, the, so your, your belief can have a powerful effect, but you can strengthen your belief and you can use visualization techniques to dig even deeper. But I, I wouldn't ever like to offend anyone uh -huh. by saying, that I think the the mind can cure anything because that's if if I was in such a position and someone said that to me I'd say well I've tried everything it doesn't kind of work and and so I, I think there are true real genetic disorders even someone visualising for cancer for example it might help some people but most people require a uh, some therapy a. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as using visualization. So I always say to people, if you're using your mind, it's not instead of medical advice, it's in addition to. And, you know, clinical studies show, for example, if someone's taking medication like chemotherapy for radiotherapy for cancer, but in addition, they visualize their immune system as well, then it enhances the treatment and the, the immune system actually becomes far more active through the visualization. But if you ask someone just to visualize their immune system instead of taking any medication or lifestyle change, I think on the whole that isn't very clever because most, peop most people don't, we don't have the knowledge yet. No. I think it's possible that consciousness can have a massively powerful effect. I think the point I'm trying to make is we don't understand how to do it yet. Yeah. I think that's the point. I, 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 want us to, I want us to understand that we're limit limitless, yeah. but I just 
think we don't know how to do it yet. So I, I tried to stay away from saying that the mind can cure anything because yeah. at, at the it's moment, a big statement. at the moment, yeah, at the moment, we don't know how to do that. Yeah. You know, we just don't. So yeah. I always, I always say, use your mind in addition to mm -hmm. whatever else you're doing, not instead of, because I just think we don't know how to do it yet. Yeah. And we're going to, I've been studying the brain for so long and we'll keep studying it as, as something that has not really been cemented down how to understand that because our thoughts can make us sick but the good thing is they can also make us better absolutely yeah. so for you then what do you think why do you think like depression and suicide's on the rise just now oof great question uh, i think there's a number of a number of factors uh, i i think people get a bit disenfranchised with with the world i think people feel a lot of people feel more and more powerless you know, social media is good for some people, but it's not so good for others. One of the things I was looking through for one of my books, I wrote a book called I Heart Me, all about self-esteem. Uh, and that in one sense, I found research showing an increase in depression and suicide rates around in teenagers. But some of that was connected to a feeling that everyone else's profile was better than theirs and you needed to get more likes and we, we we start looking at who we actually are and start looking for comparing ourselves to other people and, and trying to artificially inflate ourselves and having a profile that isn't really who we actually are and so I think there was a definitely a connection between self-esteem obviously self-esteem and you know depression suicide but there was also a connection with why that self-esteem issue arose in the first place and some of it for many teenagers especially was was linked to their online persona and trying to be better mm -hmm. so that everyone could see them as something else and so one of the things i've always tried to do is say to people you're enough just as you are yeah but again it's try to get people to believe that if you're getting told you're not good enough if you've been abused mentally physically when you're younger you can be stuck in that rut, but know, you can't break the chain. You can break the chain. The brain is like a sponge. Should we be ch changing the school curriculum? How do you spell that? Say that again. Cur Cur curriculum. 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 Do you think we should be changing more about the mindset, love, compassion, Absolutely. honesty, money management, Absolutely. yoga techniques, breathing Absolutely. techniques? Because we're learning things that are in the past also. And some of these things are great, but the majority of things you learn in primary school or secondary, you don't use in the workplace. I wish I had learned self-management mm -hmm. tools. And, you know, self-management meaning the ability to understand your own state and change your state. You know, maybe... This is what how I'm feeling. Is there, is there a tool that I can do to change how I feel? I'd love to have learned meditation, for example, as a kid. I've been into quite a number of schools now, primary schools and high schools, talking to kids about kindness. Mm -hmm. And I talk about the five side effects of kindness. You know, how kindness makes us happier. It, it's good for the heart, slows aging, it, it improves relationships. It's also contagious. It has a, a ripple effect. It, one thing leads to another one. A small act of kindness can affect, can ripple out and affect thousands of people. Uh, and kids are so interested. I mean, they literally love that stuff. And the te it's the teachers that want me to come in. And who, in fact, I recently spoke to 156 formers and the teacher, the, the head of that section wants me to come back now and talk to all of the years and some of the parents because they see learning about kindness and compassion and, and love and generosity of spirit as something fundamental to what children should learn. Because if you think think about it, children are, are, are going to be the leaders of the next generation. So if we can, uh, through education, instill in them how important it is to be to have an attitude of kindness. And I'm talking not just about doing acts of kindness, but having an attitude of kindness where the the attitude of the desire to help people to be nice is something that infiltr infiltrates everything that you do. It's just your kind of way. It's how you think about people. Mm -hmm. It's how you speak to people. And think about the different types of decisions that might be made in governments and in lead in corporate uh, leadership situations. If all everyone had learned about these principles of kindness and compassion at an early age. But do you think that's why these things are in place so people can't really think for themselves? In school, you use is it a left side part of your brain, which yeah, is your dominantly your yeah. your memorization your rights your creativity and your individuality for me kids at school i worry for the generation i've got two kids the next generation i've got two kids myself and 
uh, people who go to schools are the there's more kids with iPhones, designer clothes. They're kind of forgetting the real purpose in life, and it's hard because I'm still learning, you're still learning, and not necessarily what we are saying is right. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But it just feels right. So th there was a study. I watched one of your videos. Was, was that a six week study where people showed acts of kindness? Yep. Can you explain that also? Yeah. So it, it was in one study two groups of people okay. and one group were asked just to be normal. These are what you call a control study. And the other group were asked once at one day a week. So let's say you picked a Friday, for example. So you select one day a week and on that day, you've got to do five acts of kindness between the time you're waking up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night. And they have to do that every, that every Friday for six weeks. And they found at the end of the study that those people had actually grown in happiness having done the kindness and they were significantly happier than the people who were just leading their lives as normal. There's other variations in the study where you don't just do a uh, one act, five acts of kindness on one day, but you spread them out over the week. But all of every version of that study, there's lots of versions of it where scientists try different things, but every version comparing being kind versus normal, just control group, as you, as you say, every single study shows a net increase in people's, well, overall happiness and well-being. So why is everybody not jumping on this? Why are they not? Why is this not getting shouted from the rooftops? Not enough people know about it. You know, it's one of the. Th it's part of my work. My my one of my real passions is to educate people about the the benefits and you know really all the science of kindness. And the reason why I do the science is it's, it brings something new to the conversation. I find a lot of people, you just read a wee book about kindness and many people think, oh, I already know about kindness. So I bring something else to the conversation. Here's what happens to your heart. Here's what happens to your arteries. Mm -hmm. I mean, being kind because of how it makes you feel softens, releases the tension in the walls of your arteries, reduces blood pressure. You know, people don't know that. And kindness generates a hormone in the bloodstream that acts in the skin and helps to slow down the aging process of skin cells and it's the exact opposite to what happens when we're under chronic stress we know chronic stress ages us but there is a the body has a natural opposite a uh, process mm -hmm. that gets switched on when you're being kind because of how it makes you feel and it's the exact opposite so the aging process of cells slow down so i bring all this new to the conversation mm -hmm. to get people immersed in the, the idea and the notion of kindness, then I throw in things that, oh, by the way, kindness is the right thing to do. Look at the ripple effect, how you can change people's lives. So if you look at my social media profile, I'm pushing kindness all the time. Every mm -hmm. other, most, I'd say maybe two thirds of all my posts have mm -hmm. something to do with kindness. Messages and, in them. And even though I, I could, I've written 10 books, mm -hmm. I, I have tracked my stats and I could easily be always pushing some of the stuff from my other books, which would get far more likes and it would get far more reach. But, and I even did a survey and 90% of people wanted to hear about the mind-body connection. So I still put that in with self-esteem and stuff. But even though I know it doesn't sell as well, mm -hmm. I still keep pushing the yeah. kindness because it, to me it feels more important and more valuable. Because it's free. And it's, it's and free. It's and even though it doesn't raise my profile, yeah. it doesn't sell my books very well. My kindness books sell technically less than my other books, mm -hmm. but I still keep pushing it because I think it's so important. And I think there's not enough people shouting it from the rooftops. Mm, because it feels right for you. It's crazy that... Our bodies are the most expensive piece of machinery on this planet. You are what you eat, you are what you speak. We'll clean our cars, we'll clean our house, we'll polish our shoes, but yet we'll go and smoke, take drugs, eat shit, including myself, we've done it for many years. It's difficult to understand that because it's mm. Dr. Amoto. I did my, I did a oh, Reiki yeah. course. I was going through a change. I'm a boy from a rough area, so mm. I was going through a, a massive change. I mm. didn't know what the fuck was happening, David. Yeah. Um end up reading a lot of books and end up doing a Reiki course, end up becoming a Reiki master. I'm sitting in I a loving well. room. I'm, a Reiki, I'm, a Reiki master I'm sitting in a loving room full of women and they're all giving each other energy. And I'm <laughs> looking around and I'm going, what the fuck am I doing? I I, I'm losing my shit. But the, the, she showed me a video. I went to a seminar, a man called Dr. Amoto. Yeah. Dr. Amoto used to take photos of water, crystals, and he used to speak to the water. Now this sounds crazy, but Google it and check it out. He spoke, spoke to the water, beautiful words, I love you, you are beautiful. He took photos of it. He also did it with crystals and water that he froze and spoke bad to it. The ones who spoke nice to 
was like beautiful snowflakes, crystals, and the one he spoke bad to was like red and yellow yeah. and all bad signs. I think there's a jam jar challenge you can do also. Yeah. You get two jam jars, fill each jam jar with rice, say I love you to one for yeah. 30 days and I hate you to one for 30 yeah. days. After the 30 days, the one you say I love you to is still pure white and the one you say I hate you is all black, blue and mouldy. So you are what you speak and if you're speaking like shit, you're going to feel like shit. Aye. Do you know what I mean? It's I, to, I, I know I know about that research very well because I, I did Reiki as well, actually. Uh -huh. I had a similar experience. I was the only guy. This, <laughs> this is, I think I did my Reiki training, be, became a Reiki master in 2001. Mm -hmm. and uh, But it was great. But that's when I also became familiar. I think it was my Reiki master at the time who told me about Emoto's work. Mm -hmm. And I decided I was a scientist. I wasn't long out of the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. I'm going to replicate his research but I didn't have the microscopy techniques. It's a technique called dark field microscopy oh. that allows you to photograph like ice crystals, for example, and you can put a light through them so that you can photograph them in the dark. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the equipment. So I decided to do the exact same thing, but instead I would use biology. So I took 3,000 seeds of cress, 3,000 seeds, and I put it into into pots of 50 so I had 60 pots of counted out hand counted 50 cress seeds and then I took some water and I took cups like this paper cups mm -hmm. and in one paper cup I wrote love and one cup paper cup I wrote fear one cup cup I wrote happy one cup I wrote sad another cup I took rose quartz so ground quartz and I ground I squat, ground it up in a wheat powder and I taped it to the underside of the or not in the water, but the underside of it. Then every day, I filled each cup with water. So now the cup was was in a cup. Now the water was in a cup that had love, uh -huh. fear, happy, sad. And then I took a syringe and I took exactly one milliliter. This was me doing science. Exactly one milliliter. And I injected the one milliliter into all of the 60 pots. And I did that and I covered them. And every day for seven days, I did exactly the same. So a row of pots would get love water. Mm -hmm. A row of pots would get fear water. A row of pots would get happy water. A row would get sad water. And a row of pots would get water infused by the energy of, of say, the energy of the magnetic field of rose quartz. Anyway, amazingly, when I measured them at the end of the week, I literally measured them with a pair of tweezers, stretching them on a ruler. And you could see a visible difference, but I measured 3,000 seeds mm -hmm. of cress. That's eight hours of my life I'll never get back. <laughs> that, was a, that was a long day. Mm -hmm. But get this, the when you looked at them and measured them all out, the seeds that had been watered with happy water were significantly taller, sprouts much taller than the seeds that had been watered with sad water. The seeds that had been watered with happy water, it, sorry, love was much bigger than fear. The, the seeds that had been watered with happy water were much taller than the seeds watered with sad water. Mm -hmm. So love was stronger than fear. Happy was stronger than sad and rose quartz was stronger than anything at all. Mm -hmm. Rose quartz combined with positive emotion, the seeds were significantly mm -hmm. bigger. It just goes to show though, I believe everything's... We're, we're biology. Yeah, everything's frequencies and energies, yeah. I believe that. Again, I, I spoke about this months ago, um, about the piano. Some people physically played it and some people mentally played it. Can you explain that also? Because I think when I explained it, I probably butchered that a bit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a study at, at Harvard. It was done by a professor called Alvaro Pascal Leone, very famous neurologist. Mm -hmm. They got a group of volunteers to sit in front of a piano and play a sequence of five notes, each of the five fingers, so plunk, 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 up and down a scale for two hours on five consecutive days. That's quite tiring, so you don't really just go... Plunk, plunk, plunk. You go, you plunk for a minute, you rest for a couple of minutes, you plunk, rest. But for a period of two hours, on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, had the brain scanned every day, and they focused in on the region of the brain connected to the finger muscles. And they found that that region grew like a muscle. So by the Friday, it was 30 to 40 times bigger than it had been on the Monday. So five days, the phenomenon we now know is called neuroplasticity. So the brain changes. But a, sep a second group of people, instead of sitting in front of a piano playing the notes with their fingers, they sat with their hands flat on a table, closed their eyes, and imagined they were doing that. It's called kinesthetic imagery. And what that means is you're imagining the feelings of actually moving. So hands flat on the table, close their eyes, and just imagined to the best of their ability that they were going plunk, 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 again for two hours and five consecutive days. They also had their brain scanned every day. And amazingly, by the fifth day, 
their brain had also grown in that region by 30 to 40 times. And if you hold the brain scans side by side, you cannot tell the difference between the group who'd physically played the notes with their fingers and the group who'd played the notes with their mind. It was mm. exactly the same. That's crazy. They say we have, is it 60,000 thoughts a day? Yeah, something or like more. That, yeah. So for people who are in the struggle, for people who's got addiction issues, for people who's got anxiety or depression, what would advice or tools or techniques for would you give them for to maybe change and yeah. to change the neural pathways and get a better understanding that you're the one who's creating their thoughts, but you're also the one who can fucking change them. Yeah, I think what gives a what I've noticed gives a lot of people a sense of hope is just understanding that wee bit of science that the brain is rewiring all the time. Sometimes if we if we see if we know that there can be light at the end of the tunnel, like if you know, for example, you can maybe rewire a pattern in two or three weeks or some some studies suggest a wee bit longer than that. If you know that you can do that and you've you've looked at some of the, the research and you think, my God, if I can keep this up for two or three weeks, I might actually be physically changing the wiring in my brain. And I think that that kind of idea gives people hope because you know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's not a case of someone just saying, try this and we all know what it's like to break an addiction. But if you know that in a short space of time, relatively short space of time, you can actually rewire the brain. And when it begins to rewire, the cravings will begin to disappear. And so I find sometimes explaining just that goes a long way to helping people break patterns, break addictions, just knowing that there's light at the end of the tunnel. If I do it for this period of time, even if it's just two or three weeks, it is possible I can actually rewire my brain. Yeah, they say it takes 21 days to break a habit, yeah, 21 yeah. days to create a new one. There's all different studies and theories. Yeah. For me, when I was going through the change, I, I wrote it down, no drink, no drugs, no gambling, stuck it in the wall, and every day I would, I would write 10 affirmations and repeat them for 10 days, and it worked. Fantastic. It seemed to, well, yeah, yeah. it's clearly worked. Yeah, yeah. But for people who don't believe it, give it a go, write down two things you love about yourself or you're happy with or that you want to change, repeat it. If constantly repeat it, is it neurons that fire and fire, wire, wire together? together yeah. So if you do it consistently, then it will create that pattern. Yeah. And what you actually did, you added something really vital onto that. You created a different state. You know, mm. so, sorry me saying light at the end of the tunnel, but what you actually did is you you did something else as well as believing you can break this habit. You actually created a different state by writing down 10 things every day, by focusing on that. Mm -hmm. So at, so as your brain's rewiring, it's rewiring in a positive way because of the state, the, the emotional state and the psychological state you're creating. So you're wiring your emotional state and your determination and your gratitude you're wiring that and so when that when the habit changes after 21 days it's changed to something else and you've actually decided what that something else was which is yeah. gratitude positivity mm -hmm. all these kind of things because we still get i still get negative thoughts oh, every day do you know so what i mean I. I still feel it fucking cracking up i'm going to be honest this isn't just sitting in mountains and jumping in waterfalls and meditation it's and breathing. it's the struggle's real yeah absolutely. but i can handle it more maturely, I think. Don't get me wrong. I, I have my moments, and I'll, I'll, I will get hit of depression for maybe a day or two, but I can't be asked leaving the house. But then I go, I don't want to leave my legacy like this. I need to get up and fight against that. You're you're very big against for um, the law of attraction. Um, you are what you think. Like attracts like. How did strong did that belief start to come for you when you started to go? This is working. Uh, I've I've always had a belief ever since I was a child that. That which you are, your being, isn't inside your head. Maybe it was intuitive. But I, from as young as I can remember, maybe I was about 12 or 13 when I started to really formalise it. I had this strong feeling that, you know, what you see when you look in the mirror is only a tiny part of you. And this might sound daft for, like, let's say, a 12-year-old, but I had this belief that we're all interconnected. And even though you and I are sitting opposite a table... If you were, if there was some kind of scanner that could show my consciousness and your consciousness, what you would actually see is two lights, and but those lights wouldn't be one over there, one over there. There'd be a focus over here and a focus over there, but there'd be a big connection and uh, there'd be a big connectedness between us at the moment. And then everyone else that you know in your life is also a connectedness. So what you get is you have focal points of consciousness, but it's like strands that interconnect everyone and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's how I intuitively saw the world when I was a child. And and my intuition about it hasn't changed at all now. It's just got stronger. And I've had, you know, I've been looking for the science, bits of science that might validate and explain some of that. 
So I think when you have a hope or a dream or an, a desire, an affirmation, and you start to imagine it intensely and keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it, what you're actually doing is you're sending off a pulse like a radio broadcast that said, this is what I would like, please. And then people who can help you, who might be able to play a role in that, through this connected, as you call it, a web, mm -hmm. uh, and through this connectedness, people start gravitating towards you, coming into your life, who have the answers or the solutions or the ability or who have some role to play in helping you to, to manifest the exact thing that you're imagining. And the key to making it work is just like you talked about the brain. You can only change the brain through consistency. So similarly, when we consistently put it out there, this is my hope, this is my dream, this is what I'm imagining and affirming. Through this connectedness, we're pulling things, we're attracting things, people and situations to us mm. which are in harmony with the state of our own consciousness, yeah. with the thoughts that you're thinking. Yeah, everything's, I believe everything's frequencies. When I was drinking, taking drugs, gambling, my whole surroundings was the people who were doing the exact same. Mm. So when I stopped that, it become. Don't get me wrong, it is a lonely journey, David. You probably tend to see that yourself. We're constantly searching. But for me, when I became a better person, I started more like-minded people also who kind of understood the journey. I didn't really feel alone then. But because the gut-mind connection also, the guts, uh, is this true? The gut's made the same material as the brain? In many ways, the, the gut, has, you know, gut has a vast amount of neurons. Mm. So it's almost like your gut has a brain yeah your second brain the say. second brain yeah and it plays a, I think we're only just beginning to understand in science the importance of gut health for your mm. your clarity of mind your health of your mind and your brain and also your immune system and all these have things have you ever heard of a thing called sun gazing I've heard of it I, so, I don't know what it is so sun gazing is looking directly at the sun so for people watching this might sound crazy so everything that's grown from this earth fruit veg trees plants all the all the good stuff so the stuff that we eat from the earth to say is most important for us which is the sun's reserves so if you cut that out there's there was a guy who i watched in india it was on for over an hour powerful stuff I, I don't even know what it's called but i'll put it in the bio so sun gazing is looking directly at the sun it's our main frequency the reason why cancer rates so high in scotland is because not enough vitamin d so the sun if you look at the sun an hour before sunset or sunrise you can start off 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. If you look directly at the sun, they say it gives you your proper nutrition and aligns everything back in your body mm. and it cures you of all disease. It's powerful, powerful mm. stuff. Sun gazing. Yeah, so, I'd, he I'd heard of it, but I wasn't yeah, it's familiar with it. And it sounds it crazy is. for people, but look it up, check it out, uh, Google it. Your YouTube, sun gazing. It's, um, you know, in, in a sense, uh, plants mm -hmm. are really the sun's energy just being transformed chemically. I mean, it's this the the energy, the frequency of UV light from the sun. It, so that sunlight from the sun it causes a different processes to occur in plants. Mm. And what the plants are really doing is they're capturing sunlight. So as a plant is growing, the plant is essentially capturing sunlight. So when you're eating a plant, this is what one maybe one of the spiritual reasons why, as well as affecting the gut and the brain, a whole foods plant based diet, which is getting all of your nu nutrients from from plants. Ultimately, energetically, you're eating light. <laughs> you're eating the sun. So sun you're eating, gazing you're is the sun. what you're doing is cutting that off and getting directly from the sun. They say you go blind. Well, look at the sun. Listen, I'm not a doctor, but it's there's no studies to say that anybody's ever went blind. That's why they tell you to look at it. I never sunset or sunrise when it, the rays isn't as strong. It's powerful stuff. Mm. So when you wrote your first book, how did that come about also? Uh, well, it was a dream actually when I left the pharmaceutical industry. I, I really, I knew as part of my journey going out and speaking that I wanted to be a writer. And it's funny because I failed my English at school. Mm -hmm. And if anyone had said to me when I hated English, I hated it. Mm -hmm. I loved chemistry. I loved maths. I loved the, the technical stuff. I hated it. Oh my God, I hated mm -hmm. English. It was, I found it so boring. And uh, I passed it my second time. I had a, 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 a teacher who really helped me a lot when I resat the, the English a guy called Mr. McCall. And uh, if anyone had said to me, oh, by the way, you'll write for a living, you'll be a writer, I'd have laughed. I went, oh, ho, ho, mm. absolutely no chance. But yet what changed in my mind was realising that writing is really just a vehicle. It's just a way that I can express what mm. I'm teaching. And so my writing style is very much, in some ways it reflects my speaking style. So my, my writing, as I construct a book, what I'm actually doing is I'm teaching 
So maybe there's a, a proper way to write books mm -hmm. where you build certain ways, but I don't write books in that way. I write books when I, I'm actually teaching because I want people to understand the power of these techniques mm -hmm. and, and principles. So the first book was something I, I wanted to do. I tried, I stopped and started umpteen times and threw it away because I really didn't know how to write and I didn't really know what I was writing about. And then I'd run a charity, I'd set up a charity with some friends called Spirit Aid Foundation, which is still thriving under David Heyman, the actor. Where can people look at, get this? Uh, well, spiritaid.org.uk, mm -hmm. I think, is a site. David Heyman Where and can I, people buy your books also, David? Oh, Amazon. Amazon. Uh, Waterstones Bookshop, mm -hmm. any, really any book, mm -hmm. any place where books are sold. And I decided, I, we, I, we'd finished a big charity project, and I decided, you know, I'm going to start writing now. I've put it off for a few years because I didn't really know how to write. A wee bit it. of fear there as well. Oh, absolutely. I, I was pushing myself away, really, because mm. I didn't know how to do it. And I just mm -hmm. decided, you know what? I went bankrupt, right? Mm -hmm. So I ran the charity. It got really big. It grew really quick. And I was absolutely broke. David Heyman, it was absolutely broke. And a few of us founders of it had put all of our resources into it. We ended up, all of us broke. And I needed to leave and get it, get work. So I took a job as a, a lecturer. I taught chemistry for a year and, and ecology, a wee bit of maths. Uh, and I tutored at Glasgow University in the adult education department for a year. And during that time, I, I started researching and writing my first books. I spent months in Glasgow University Library, actually, just looking through medical journals and, and other stuff and just building a picture of the science that I wanted to talk about in my first book. It's called It's the Thought That Counts. And I covered such a broad subject from you know, not only the mind-body connection, but evidence for prayer and evidence for hands-on healing and evidence for vibrational medicine and evidence for consciousness. I pulled it all together. And, and once I had all the information, I had no idea how to write. I just started writing and it took me two years. You know, I, I just wrote it all in one continual chapter. And I put it all in the, all the pages on the ground and I, I said, well, that goes with that and that goes with that. And I moved it all together and, and assembled the book into what seemed to be chapters. And I learned how to write. I think a lot of people don't, a lot of people want to write a book, but they don't because they don't know how to. Mm -hmm. And I always say to people, just start and you'll, there's no right way to write a book. There's mm -hmm. just your way. Just pull the trigger. Just, pull, just start and, yeah. and see what happens. And, and I figured it out and learned how to write. And my first book, when I gave birth to it, I still call it my baby. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to every publisher in the UK in self-help, but all of them said no. Some of them are really complimentary. It just didn't work for them at this time. So I self-published it. And then a year later, one of the publishers, Hay House, who'd said no the first time, literally took the hand off me. Mm -hmm. Please, we'll take this this book. And, and, and it's something I always say to people, if a publisher rejects you or someone rejects you in life, it doesn't really reflect who you are or the quality of what oh. you're doing. Sometimes it's just timing. It's just an yeah. opinion. It's just, like, pub, during that time, my publisher had decided that one of the things they want to do is have more books from from a qualified people like doctors and scientists. And so they just decided in that time from rejecting me the first time to signing me up the second time. During that time, they decided we want scientists and doctors yeah. And so it wasn't that they didn't like the book first time, it just didn't fit for them. Yeah, but rejection is scary. I took it hard. Because, yeah, it's heartbreaking. You're not good enough. <coughs> you can't do it. That's why 99% of people fail, Dave, is because the rejection after two and three attempts. Consistency is key. You proved it. Consistency, keep chipping away, and you eventually got the break. I used to listen to a lot of Les Brown back in the day, and he used to say all the time, people's opinion of you does not have to be your reality. 99% of success is failure and the only Absolutely. person who can fail is yourself. Yeah. So the documentary, Heal, brilliant by the way, oh, absolutely geez. excellent. Um, you appear in it a few times. So how did that come about also? Uh, well, the, the director and producer, they'd almost finished it. They'd been filming for, for months, actually, Kelly Noonan, uh, the <laughs> director, and, uh, and they'd been filming for ages and just trying to assemble the story and the narrative. And and I think they were looking for something, you know, just looking for a few extra little cross the T's, dot the I's yeah. kind of thing. And one of the other authors or, or other people in the film had mentioned me and they, they looked me up online and thought, wow, exactly what we need. So they gave me a phone and, you know, a week later I was in New York City and we were, sit, we were filming in Central Park and we were filming in this great big uh, hotel room and we just 
you know, it went really, really well. They asked me all the the relevant questions that need I think needed to fill the little gaps that were missing in the film and and you never know when you're in a documentary when you get filmed if you'll actually make the final cut I remember yeah. when it first came out and I was like I didn't want to watch it I was like, <laughs> you know I know it, my interview was an hour and a, a, an hour long and then another 45 minutes maybe in Central Park yeah. afterwards and I thought they might not use anything I was mm. I was pleasantly surprised to see mm. I think I'm in it seven times yeah. I was like yeah I'm still in it yeah but that's brilliant and plus it raises your profile and especially if you're trying to promote kindness love compassion yeah. other people then start to it's crazy because if we see someone on the TV then we start giving them a bit more rec recognition which is weird. Do you know, know what I mean? So your, pro your profile would rise it, and that's it, all part of the process. It, it did. My, my, some of my social media following, my Instagram following literally doubled within mm -hmm. a few months. Mm -hmm. You know, just when he all came into Netflix anyway. Yeah, because Joe Dispenser's on it. I, I watch yeah. a lot of Joe's stuff as well. And Joe's a lovely guy. Yeah, yeah, and he was in a bad car accident. I think he used mm -hmm. to do like Iron Man. And he, with the power of the mind... Put his spine back in place yeah, yeah. just by visualizing it every day, and every he says it's like a uh, hitting the golf ball sweet, it just clicked back in. Mm. And again, the science is there to prove it the mind, believe in yourself, I know. affirmations, consistency, write them down. Don't just again, we spoke earlier before the cameras were on. It's as much as we can preach and promote, it's try to live it yourself because I have my down days. Mm. What's your day, day like on a daily basis? What's your schedule like for when you wake up in the morning? It, it varies the first thing I do actually after my, my shower is I meditate how long for? it varies it depends how much I've, I've got on you know I always make time for it but probably at the very least 15 minutes but sometimes half an hour mm -hmm. and if I do only 15 minutes I will commit to doing another maybe 2 or 3 5 minutes so sometimes uh, I'll sit at my computer and I'll just close my eyes and I'll meditate for 5 minutes uh, during the day to try to make up half an hour a day so yeah. I, I probably manage about half an hour even if it's only a 15 and three fives or a 20 and two fives or mm. a 20 and a 10 or a half hour one go but I try to get about half an hour a day in because I recognize how much I need that how much value that I get in terms of my my, my peace of mind but my ability to manage my state so just to ground yourself again yeah and yeah kind of balance everything out what do you think about the technology then? I'm, I believe I'm addicted. In fact, I don't believe I know I'm addicted to my phone just now. I'm craving it. There's a wee bit of self-seeking in there as well, David, where I'm getting a lot of attention, but I'm focusing a lot of my energy on it. I'm wasting value bubbles, I believe, to know really pushing the boat out and, and going another level mm -hmm. in my career. So what do you think of the technology and mobile phones just now? I, I think it, I, I love technology. Mm -hmm. I, I love the, the ability to be able to access information and to be able to communicate. See, I use the, I use social media, for example, to teach and to inspire. Mm -hmm. So I have a very positive experience of it. Yeah, everyone gets negative stuff, wee bits of abuse from time to time, which, you know. How do you deal with that? I, I just ignore it. Yeah. I never, I never engage. I don't just, give it your energy. I don't give my energy at all. I just engage, block. <laughs> See, I've still got a bit of ego where I go. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, 99% of the time I've, I've learned, mm. but sometimes I'll go, no, I'm not putting up with that. Nah, I just let it go. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that's it's a refle not more a reflection of them, but I see some people just fire off comments without really thinking, and it's not always a. Ref sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not really a reflection of mm -hmm. people. Maybe someone's angry at the time about something, and they're just venting on you. And if you take it personally, you're you're actually imagining the person to be something that maybe they're not actually. Some people probably are these kind of people, but a lot of people are just venting and. I just I just don't bite. I just ignore it. You know, it's not worth my energy. Mm. I don't get it very often, to be yeah. really honest. What about for people? What books would you recommend for people, including a set, obviously your own, but other books that it's helped you along in your journey? Uh, the first book that really massively impacted me was the Norman Vincent Peale's "The Power of Positive Thinking." Mm -hmm. That's what what guided me on the path. Another huge book for me was Anita Morjani's "Dying to Be Me." Mm -hmm. Another great one was Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now. Power of we, now. We, we talked about that yeah. offline. Um, See, I, I had to listen to his audio book, man, but I feel, it was putting me to sleep, but it took me about two months to mm -hmm. listen to it. It was yeah. just to have a wee ding, and then yeah. his, his voice, I just, oh, used yeah. to just knock me out. Have you met Eckhart? No, no. I know Anita, I, I know Anita quite well, Anita Marjani. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it, actually, con the Conversations with God series, Neil Donald Walsh, that was good for me when I first left the pharmaceutical industry mm. in helping me to get more and tap more in line with compassion and kindness. Wayne Dyer's books were great for that as well, his audios. So, so I've had a number of books, I'd say, that have impacted me uh, quite heavily. I'm reading one now called Lifespan by a Harvard professor called David Sinclair mm -hmm. that's all about how ageing can be slowed and affected in, in different ways, uh, nutritionally, but through supplements and stuff. And So I, I find from time to time books just grab me and I, and I keep my best books. Mm -hmm. I've got, uh, in fact, my best series is a very metaphysical series by a, a medium called Jane Roberts. Mm -hmm. You know, the nature of personal reality, Seth speaks Are you up. a medium? No, no. Do you have the gift for that? I think everybody's got the gift for I that. I think everyone to, to an extent. It's mm -hmm. something I haven't really explored. Yeah. I've explored wee bits of science. I've done a few experiments yeah. with myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not necessarily precognition, but uh, sensing uh -huh. stuff. And, you know, statistically... On with me as the sample mm -hmm. size, just me, yeah. it, it seemed to be pretty powerful. See, I just think with the technology nowadays, I think it'd be more evidence there to show that there is maybe entities or ghosts or spirits or even like UFOs. Because it, when they show the, these footage, footage, I, I watch a lot of shit on Netflix. Sometimes I'll go down to the rabbit hole and I'll just, I'll explore. I always want yeah, for, for a human to explore think. and learn. But yeah, it's always the same shit. The repeat for the 70s, 60s, 80s. I just think with the technology nowadays, I think there'd be more cutting images that, okay, there is something there. Because if you heard of the 21 grams, when as soon as the body dies, the, the, as soon as the body I've, dies, I've heard as soon that, as you yeah. die, the body goes 21 grams lighter. But they say that's like an energy of the soul leaving the body, mm. which is weird. Which is, yeah, yeah. it's weird, the 21 that's... grams, I think it's cool. Mm. So for yourself, moving forward for the future, David, what's the plans? What's the visions? It's writing more books and teaching and, and doing more teaching online. You know, You're everywhere it. around the world, eh? Travel a lot. I, from time to time, I get little clusters. Like I, I was in uh, Paris for a conference a few weeks ago. It was the second time this year in France. I've been in Europe, Germany this year, as well, Australia. It kind of comes and goes. Most of my teachings are in the UK, yeah. most of the general public. But of corporations, I get hired with quite a lot because they're really big into the message of kindness because I, I teach how kindness is the opposite of stress. So rather than managing stress, I show them how to induce the exact opposite conditions in their mind and emotions and, mm -hmm. and physically. Uh, so to be just writing more books in my field, mind-body connection, kindness, that kind of stuff, I love doing it and I love mm -hmm. you know, communicating. I love putting free content out in social media and I do online talks and stuff. And I... I I think my thing is just to educate and inspire, and I love, uh, I love taking bits of science and simplifying them into a way that everyone can understand. Yeah, you know. So, all the places you've been in the world, is there any place that stands out? And you go, this is a real good place. People really know how to love life here, and they're they're happy. Or is everywhere kind of the same, just different everywhere, environments. I think everywhere's kind of different. I don't know if I would say any one place. I, I've had a really positive experience in Australia. I've taught there twice in the Gold Coast and it's a conference called Mind Heart Connect. They have, have it every two years. And I, I found the Australian people to be very similar to the people that I grew up around or certainly the people that were in that environment, very similar to Scottish people. I don't know if that's a compliment to Scotland <laughs> or Australia, but, um, but I, I found a lot of similarities. I felt quite comfortable in Australia. I felt quite natural. Mm -hmm. You know, and they seem to understand my Scottish accent. Okay. Yeah. They say I read a book called Many Lives, Many Masters. Oh, Brian Weiss. Yeah. Love that. And um, they say if you feel happier, you, you've probably been there in a previous life. Yeah, yeah. And they yeah. say they say also the problems and worries you've got in this life. If you don't sort them, you got you take them into the next life. Plus, they add something on. Is that mm. true? I, I, Not true, but it was in the book. Was that in the book? It was in the book. Here's an interesting. You know, I, I gave that example of. If, you know, we look physically separate than now, but if you could somehow have a, a a camera that could only see consciousness, you would see it focused here and focused there, uh, and you know, there'd be two lights, but these lights would be blending. As we communicate, the lights would be mixing and blending, and, mm -hmm. and some of my colours would be impacting yours, some of yours are impacting me, and, and, and it's happening all the time. Every time you pass someone in the street, there's a blending and mixing yeah. of the energy. But uh, that energy these lights also go back and forward in time 
So you're also blending and connecting with a past previous, even a, a version of yourself 10 minutes ago or a version mm -hmm. of your child self, mm -hmm. but also a version of your 91-year-old your self. You're also blending and mixing. We know from quantum mechanics, when you get to the quantum level, there is no time. Uh, and you, so all time is, is simultaneous. So in many ways, you are connected to that past self in terms yeah. of, if you want to use the past life example, and connected to your future selves. So, but I, I don't see it exactly as you know, if you don't resolve something now, you'll carry it into another life because there are multiple possible futures and you're also connected to multiple possible future yous. Mm -hmm. And I think when you do like a past life or a future life, past life regression or a future life projection, all you're at, what you're actually doing is you're resonating, you're, you're remembering that version of yourself that's most strongly connected with the space that you're in right now. Mm -hmm. Because Brian Weiss found that if you changed something about, if you process something right now, then you actually change the future trajectory. In other words, if you were, you're, let's say, a future life, mm -hmm. then you find yourself, you're remembering a different future. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, all of these futures exist. So there's multiple versions of you, not yeah. just one possible timeline, but, but multiple versions yeah. of James in the future so when we do a, a regression or a projection into the future we're really just resonating with a version of ourself that's most closely related to where you're at right now and if you if you you know process something right now then you'll find that there's that the version of yourself that you'll remember will be that that is more closely aligned with who you are or who you're becoming because when if you ever think about someone that's a head screw eh? yeah yeah no, but that's what it's all about <laughs> yeah if you think about someone, then you either bump into them or they call you. Absolutely. Is that because you've got that connection? Through that connectedness. That? Because deja vu as well, where you feel as if you've been there. Yeah. It does say that. It's because everything is connected to everything so else. So what do you think we are then as human beings? It's a, a question that can be answered in millions of times, but for me, all different angles. But what do you think we are? I, I, to be really honest, I believe we are pure consciousness. Uh, having a, you may, you may say a soul, having a human experience, so pure consciousness, uh, having an experience of being physical. And at this moment in time, a part of my consciousness is focused on this body and a part of your consciousness is focused on that body. But it does not mean that that is all that I am. And that's why I think when we end this, li when our, this lifetime expires, if you look at the accounts of people who've had near-death experiences, you just suddenly become part of the larger version of yourself. And that's why people have this massive sense of expansiveness that like I am the universe kind of thing, because that which you are is infinite in, in space and time. So suddenly the focus removes from this small part of the body and your focus rejoins your very essence, which is infinite in time and space. So many people, Anita Murjani, Murjani in her book, Dying to Be Me, said her experience after leaving her body, after technically dying, it was that she experienced herself as pure consciousness, as I am. Mm -hmm. You couldn't say I am this or I am that because putting anything after I am just diminished the size of who she was and she experienced herself as infinite in time and space. And many people have had a similar kind of experience, but I think that's what you, we're all infinite in space and time, but we're also all connected in that Mm. deepest possible way and maybe we're all just part of the same energy that's expressing itself in a variety of different ways do you ways. think we've already got our blueprint when we're born our, already, our purpose already here or do you think we can change our path I think both Yeah. I, I think I, I see destiny and free will as you know you're born into a river a big wide river and you have you're on a canoe and you have a paddle and the paddle is your mind mm -hmm. and you can paddle to the left or to the right or do what many people do is keep paddling around in a wee circle, repeating the same things. And, and in a sense, what you're doing is you're that's that's you're using the law of attraction to attract what you want. But if you were to stop paddling, you'll realize that the river has a current, and the current is the current, the pattern that you're born into. And if you were to do nothing, then you will find that the river will take you to certain destinations, to people, to circumstances and events. Sometimes you'll smack into a dirty great big rock because that was on your path. So there's, I believe there's a blueprint, not just genetically, but spiritually, you know, in terms of, of, of your actual essence and where the evolution of your, your spiritual self is going. So there's a genetic component in that. So I think there is a blueprint, but absolutely we can decide to 
paddle away and just say, okay, you know what, I feel that ahead of me, but I think I'm just going to mm. take a different path. So I think destiny and free will can intertwine. Yeah. And, and sometimes the most appropriate thing is to paddle. And other times the most appropriate thing is to let go. Mm -hmm. What go do you think um, of the pineal gland? Uh, I, I, they say I, this is a seat of the soul. They say this is yeah, what connects you I, I think some, some people believe that the pineal gland is a large concentration of, say, of when the consciousness is focused on the body, then a large concentration of it focuses on the pineal gland. So the pineal gland, I say, is in it. I think in the middle, or the bottom of the brain. Yeah, it used to actually be. It's not even in the brain. It's funny. It's in the brain, but it, it evolved from the roof of your mouth and the, the the roof of the mouth over millions of years went up. And it, so the pineal gland sits in a wee pocket that's actually not technically what's well, in the brain, but it's in one way it's technically not. It's it's just went up from the inside mm -hmm. I, th I think or I may be getting that wrong but I, I don't know much about the pineal yeah. gland other than the spiritual stuff that I'd read in, in some books where that's they say that's the concentration of spiritual energy like, because I've said it before um, fluoride I think because it's in toothpaste and some water they say it kills the pineal gland I've had dentists messaging mm -hmm. me because that's what in their textbook mm -hmm. that's what they're for is fluoride and toothpaste and stuff but the spiritual side of it they say it is bad for you and it uh, yeah. talk, uh, it really harms yeah, I haven't read that. Gland. To be honest, I haven't read that much about the pineal no. gland. It's to seek the soul. They say that's what gives you the your intuition. Yeah, um, yeah, powerful stuff. So, yeah. before we finish up, anything you'd like to finish up on yourself or anybody that's in the struggle or anybody that's want to change? I, I would say, do you know, the most powerful call us a spiritual practice I've ever known outside of meditation is to be kind. And I'm not just referring to doing random acts of kindness, helping, you know, someone with their shopping or making someone a cup of tea. Absolutely do that. It's very important. But what I'm, I'm really meaning by being kind is let that be your attitude. So try to be kind in how you think about people and your attitude towards people. And, you know, being patient with people, cutting people a wee bit of slack, having compassion for people. So in your in your mind first, and then how you communicate with people, and then how you interact with people. And that's benefiting people, obviously. But as a spiritual practice, what I found is it brings you home to yourself. And I found of all the spiritual practices, it's the one that fills me with warmth. And I, I know that when I'm filled with warmth, I feel huge. I feel expanded. And many people talk about seeking enlightenment and we go in search of all these things and we, we practice umpteen trillions of hours of meditation. But the strongest practice I've ever found is any practice that aligns me with the thoughts and feelings of being kind. So whether I meditate on kindness or for me, it's just about thinking kindly and nicely about people and trying to be kind in how I think, how I speak, how I communicate and how I do it. And it really brings me home to myself. And I do feel that warmth, that sense of warmth and expansiveness and clarity of mind and just kind of knowing the right thing to do because you're acting out of love and not fear. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to do a wee practice to think about it. You're already there. And I find it brings me home to that warmth space it so quickly and all I actually have to do is think some nice about someone it doesn't even have to be anyone I know it could just be thinking nice about somebody that passed in the street you know yeah. it doesn't matter for someone who's maybe depressed or negative all the time and maybe put on that spiral downward spiral for maybe 10 20 years for them then to try and think like that and it's do that hard, it's, hard, it? it's difficult but if you do it consistently it's consistency yeah. you will eventually change it but it can be done it can there's be plenty done. of people out there plenty of scientific scientific studies that it can be done david so absolutely for coming on today brother and, oh, and telling great, your story James, it's very much appreciated check out um david's books on amazon waterstones really anywhere that books are sold uh, the documentary heel on netflix i definitely definitely watch that but for telling your story brother appreciate it and all the best for the future thanks a lot it's Thank been you. my pleasure it's been great namaste today. namaste yeah <laughs>